I think none of the IPCC's predictions is going to come true. My guest today is Javier Vinos. Hi, Tom. Uh, very nice to be here with, with you and your audience today. Um, well, uh, I'm a scientist, and uh, but not a climate scientist. I'm a molecular biologist. So may, a lot of people may think, well, what is a molecular biologist doing studying climate? Because for the past nine years, I've been studying um, climate quite in depth, uh, basically with a focus on natural climate change, on how the climate changes naturally. And I did this because um, I had a science blog, and one day I decided I was going to talk about the science of climate. And when I started to read the articles and looking for the information, I became very surprised because molecular biology and um, neuroscience, which is what I do, is um, experimental sci uh, science. And climate science is not an experimental science. And I was very surprised because the evidence uh, that they were claiming was there was not. So I began researching it more and more until I became so involved. I, I started writing books and telling other people what I was finding about climate. Hello, my name is Javier Vinos. I am a scientist. Most of the time, I've done my research on molecular biology, neuroscience, and cancer. For the last nine years, I've been doing research on climate science. Whether that makes me a climate scientist is not for me to say, but I have become an expert on natural climate change. I conduct my research with an open mind and absolute neutrality. If the evidence supported that the cause of global warming is the increase in CO2, I will defend it. I strive to achieve Karl Popper's principle of scientific objectivity. I have been well trained in the scientific method by excellent teachers. Joseph Bell, a professor of medicine in Edinburgh in the 19th century, also had a good knowledge of the scientific method. He instilled it in his young assistant, Arthur Conan Doyle, who years later would use him as a model for his character, Sherlock Holmes. Even in his first book, Studying Scarlet, he makes clear one of the elementary principles of the scientific method. Establishing a theory before examining all the evidence leads to error, and confirmation bias makes us stick to it. Has the scientific method been forgotten in the postmodern age? It seems so, at least in climate science. Climatology is not an experimental science, which is a major handicap. It is also a very young science compared to the mainstream sciences of physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. The consensus was reached in 1988, almost without data, and hastily based on the greenhouse effect and the coincidence of temperature and CO2 during the Pleistocene in Antarctic ice cores. There are two absolutely essential processes in determining climate that are largely unknown. The first is albedo, or the amount of sunlight reflected back into space. It is crucial because it determines the amount of energy the Earth receives. We ignore why it has the value it has, why it varies so little from year to year, why it varies so much from month to month, why both hemispheres have the same albedo, and how the albedo has changed in the past. As a result of our ignorance, models are unable to adequately reproduce the Earth's albedo, failing to show its small interannual variability, its large seasonal variability, and its symmetry between the two hemispheres. Nevertheless, many scientists believe that the models are capable of predicting changes in albedo. Otherwise, they will have to admit that the models cannot predict future climate. Small changes in albedo can produce large climate changes of natural origin, and this is the basis of several alternative hypotheses to CO2. I have focused my research on a second essential process, and this is what my book is about. The transport of heat from the equator to the poles, also known as meridional heat transport, 
because it runs in the direction of the meridians. There is much evidence that this is the primary cause of natural climate change. Heat transport is also an enormously neglected process. We do not know how it works, and there is no established theory to explain it. We also do not know how it is distributed between the atmosphere and the ocean, how it is divided among the different types of ocean currents, how it changes with the seasons, how it changes from year to year, why Antarctica receives less heat than the Arctic, although it should receive more, or why heat is transported from the colder hemisphere to the warmer hemisphere. In fact, we can even measure it properly. And if we don't know how heat transport works, it's obvious that the models don't either. They fail miserably at reproducing the amount of heat being transported and reflecting transport changes in the atmosphere and ocean. They do not even correctly reproduce the distribution line, the climatic equator where the trade winds from both hemispheres converge. Nor do they reproduce seasonal changes since the amount of heat entering and leaving the ocean throughout the year is not known. If no one understands heat transport, then models cannot understand it either, because they are just a product of our minds with no physical connection to reality. Even if there are other secondary causes of climate change, including increased CO2, the evidence points to changes in heat transport as the primary way in which the climate changes. In the end, like the joke about the drunk who looks under a street lamp for his lost keys, because the light is better there than where he thinks he lost them, climatologists look for the answer where the knowledge is better. In the greenhouse effect, the culprits are certain gases that together make up 1% of the atmosphere. In this graph, we can see the profile of the gases that make up the atmosphere in different colors, showing their abundance on the lower axis with respect to altitude on the vertical axis. The gases in the squares do not absorb in the infrared. Note that water vapor with a blue dotted line is very abundant near the surface, but a thousand times less abundant in the stratosphere. The opposite is true for ozone with a purple dashed line, which is almost entirely in the stratospheric ozone layer. The thick black line is the temperature profile, which in the troposphere has a positive lapse rate. That is, the higher we go, the colder it gets. This is fundamental to the greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect? In order to return all the energy it receives from the sun and maintain stability, the Earth must emit at a temperature of 23 degrees Celsius below zero. Without greenhouse gases, this would be the average surface temperature instead of the current 14.5 degrees. The black line in this graph represents the temperature profile of the troposphere, and the lapse rate is the slope of that line. In the absence of greenhouse gases, infrared radiation would be emitted from the surface, but greenhouse gases make the atmosphere opaque to infrared radiation, so this radiation is emitted from higher altitudes, as shown by the black arrow. Although in reality there is emission from all heights, including the surface, the average height of emission is about 6 kilometers. The emission temperature at this height is 23 degrees below zero, but the lapse rate of about 6 degrees per kilometer makes the surface about 37 degrees warmer. If we were to double the CO2 as shown in red and everything remained the same, the average emission height would increase by about 150 meters as the atmosphere becomes more opaque. So the temperature at that height would be one degree cooler. It would be necessary for the surface and atmosphere to warm by that degree in order for the Earth to return the energy it receives from the sun, which is absolutely necessary. But in the climate system, everything is interconnected. And when something changes, everything changes and nobody knows how much the temperature would change. So when they tell us that we have to reduce our emissions by a certain amount to avoid some amount of warming, they are lying to us because nobody knows that. These gases cause the greenhouse effect. 
only the first three are really important. They are trace gases, but that does not diminish their importance. Ozone is a thousand times less abundant than CO2, but its contribution to the greenhouse effect is only five times less. Look at water vapor in yellow. Together with the clouds it forms, it is responsible for three quarters of the greenhouse effect, but its abundance varies greatly because it depends on temperature. When the temperature drops, it condenses and falls as water or snow. Because of this, the greenhouse effect is very variable on the planet. At the poles, there is practically no water vapor or clouds in winter. These are the places on Earth with the driest atmosphere and a much weaker greenhouse effect. This is not given much attention, but it is very important, and I point it out in the book as one of the pieces that must be used to solve the puzzle. Having such a weak greenhouse effect makes it very easy for heat to escape from the Earth through the poles. The climate works like the internal combustion engine of a car, only instead of one cooling system, it has two, one at each pole. The engine block is the tropics, the hottest part, because that is where most of the sun's energy arrives. The tropics lose heat by radiation, but not enough. The excess must be transported to the radiators to be radiated to the outside, and this is done by a fan, which is equivalent to the atmosphere, and a circuit with a cooling liquid, which is equivalent to the ocean. The Arctic radiator is more efficient and more variable than the Antarctica radiator. Climatologists do not see it this way, but the other way around. For them, heat transport does not change the temperature of the planet, but only warms the poles. But because of this erroneous view, they encounter paradoxes that they cannot resolve. In the early Eocene, at the beginning of the age of mammals, the poles were so temperate that palm trees grew in the Arctic and frogs lived in Antarctica, indicating that the average temperature of the coldest month was above freezing. Climatologists do not understand how this was possible because the smaller temperature difference made the heat transport much smaller, which prevented the poles from warming. Like all paradoxes, it is solved by changing the frame of reference. It was possible because the smaller heat transport made the planet lose less heat and get warmer, which warmed the poles along with the rest. When it is winter in one hemisphere, the atmosphere transports more heat to that hemisphere. But the atmosphere also carries angular momentum or rotational inertia. Since it is a conserved property, any change in the angular momentum of the atmosphere must be compensated for by a change in the spin rate of the Earth, just as an ice skater increases their spin rate by bringing their arms closer to their body. Similar to the skater, the Earth's spin rate increases by about one millisecond per day as atmospheric circulation and heat transport increase in winter. Since 1962, it has been possible to measure this to an accuracy of one microsecond, thanks to the invasion of the atomic clock and radio astronomy, which makes it possible to know the exact orientation of the Earth in space. Well, it has been known since the 1970s that solar activity affects the Earth's rotation. It has been published many times. The phenomenon is particularly pronounced during the boreal winter. As we can see in the graph above for 2015, a year of high solar activity, and 2018 with low activity and it is measured by the variation in milliseconds of day length. In the lower graph, we can see the solar activity represented by the sunspot cycle with a red dashed line. The black solid line shows the changes in the Earth's rotation caused by the boreal winter. It shows the same cycle as the Sun, although the Earth's rotation is also affected by equatorial stratospheric winds and the El Niño phenomenon. The dotted line is from a paper published in 2014. Everyone ignores this phenomenon, especially the IPCC, which says that the sun does not affect climate. But if the sun can change the Earth's rotation speed, then it can change the climate. My research has been like that of Sherlock Holmes, looking for clues that have been missed in ignored and forgotten studies. The effect of the sun on the rotation of the Earth has been known for 50 years, but very few people in the world know about it. What I have learned about climate science is because I've stood on the shoulder of giants. Giants like the Canadian atmospheric physicist 
Colin Hines, who explained in a 1974 paper that the sun's effect on climate could be due to planetary waves. He was ignored and his theory was forgotten. Art lovers will recognize the great wave print by Hokusai. Atmospheric waves are like ocean waves, except that they move in three directions. Planetary waves are the largest. Many of you will remember the tsunami that occurred in Indonesia at Christmas 2004. It reached the coast of Africa 6,000 kilometers away in eight hours, traveling at the speed of an airplane. Obviously, water does not travel, energy travels, and when it is released upon reaching the coast, it still causes damage. Planetary waves are atmospheric tsunamis that hit the wind walls of the polar vortex and weaken them. What worries us is when cold air escapes from the interior because it produces very cold waves and storms. But the climate is more affected by the heat that is exchanged with that cold because the planet loses it and cannot compensate for it. Another giant on whose shoulders I've stood is Karin Lavitsky, who in 1987 found a correlation between the temperature of the polar stratosphere in winter and the solar cycle. It is an extraordinary finding, because in winter the sun does not shine on the pole. It is a relationship in the dark, not based on solar energy. It is also extraordinary because it is the first proof of a solar effect on the climate after 190 years of a search begun in 1800 by William Herschel, the discoverer of Uranus and infrared radiation. Instead of giving her the Nobel Prize she deserved for such a fantastic discovery, her finding was ignored and she is not even mentioned in climate books. Here I show only the data for years of low solar activity. 30 hectopascals is about 20 kilometers in the stratosphere. When the tropical wind blows from the west, as shown by the blue circles, the polar stratosphere is very cold. But when it blows from the east, as shown by the red circles, the polar stratosphere warms by about 15 degrees. In years of high solar activity, the effect is reversed, as I show in the book. The El Niño phenomenon also strongly influences this effect. For many scientists, a solar effect that occurs in the dark reverses depending on equatorial winds and depends on other phenomena is too complicated to understand and they prefer to ignore it, but not to me, because I have studied Heinz. The propagation of planetary waves into the stratosphere depends on several factors that affect the dynamics of stratospheric circulation. How does the sun influence these dynamics? We know that solar activity affects the Earth's rotation, heat transport, and atmospheric circulation. We also know from Lavizke, for the last 35 years, that it affects the temperature of the polar stratosphere. And it does so, as Heinz said 50 years ago, by affecting the propagation of planetary waves into the stratosphere. These waves strike the polar vortex. This is a gigantic tornado that circles the polar regions in winter with sustained wind speeds of 180 km per hour. Since heat is carried by the wind, the warm winds from the south have a hard time getting through this wall of wind, creating a strong temperature gradient, as shown in the second image. The black line in the graph shows the profile of this gradient, which is a real wall that creates a 30 degrees difference between its two sides, as shown by the red dashed line. By weakening the vortex, planetary waves allow heat to enter and cold to leave. This changes the temperature of the polar region, and as we saw at the beginning, the greenhouse effect inside the vortex is very weak. It causes the planet to lose unrecoverable energy. This is how the sun affects the climate, as explained by Heinz and Lavitke. And I am not just saying this, it has been shown. The study of planetary waves in the stratosphere is extremely difficult, because they are invisible and the stratosphere is little known. But there is already a study based on measurements that proves it. And the intensity of the planetary waves depends on the solar cycle, as its authors defend. The short-tooth appearance of the amplitude of the planetary waves is due to the effect of the tropical winds, which change direction every one or two years, and to the El Niño effect. My contribution to these studies is to put all the pieces together. 
the low polar greenhouse effect and the effect of the sun on the Earth's rotation, heat transport, atmospheric circulation, polar temperatures, and planetary waves. And to show the effect that all this has not only on climate, but also on climate change. When there is low solar activity, the Arctic warms, as shown in blue by the temperature of the central Arctic, according to data from the Danish Meteorological Institute. Today, global warming and Arctic warming are linked in our minds. We have forgotten that between 1976 and 1997, despite intense global warming, the Arctic not only did not warm, but actually experienced a slight cooling in its central zone. Just as we have forgotten that the Arctic warmed in a similar way 100 years ago. It was reported at the time, and there are scientific studies that support an Arctic warming a century ago similar to today's in its effect on Greenland's melting. Why did this happen? It is because solar activity has a cycle of about 100 years. This graph shows the level of activity of each solar cycle relative to the average, and we can appreciate the centennial solar cycle. Shortly after 1700, 1800, 1900, and 2000, solar activity was below average and the Arctic warmed. When solar activity is high, the opposite happens and the Arctic cools, but the rest of the planet warms because it becomes more efficient at conserving energy. The IPCC acknowledges that solar activity in the 20th century was in the top 10% of the last 9,000 years. In the graph, we can see the trend line indicating that solar activity has been increasing for the past 300 years. And global warming is 200 years old. We can see it in the behavior of glaciers, which began to shrink worldwide in 1820, as shown by the line in the graph. The photos are from the Rhone Glacier in Switzerland, which melt enormously between 1850 and 1900. People didn't care, on the contrary, they built hotels for tourists where the glacier used to be. Climate proxies show the same thing. The green line is from tree rings, and the orange line is from other proxies. Both show a 30-year oscillation on a long-term warming trend. In stark contrast, our emissions in gray were non-existent until 1900 and low until 1950. The curves clearly do not match. A much better match is obtained for solar activity, shown in annual data with a thin line and a decades-long smoothing that shows in red when it was above average and in blue when it was below average. The modern solar maximum is the long 70-year period in the 20th century when it was above average, something that has happened only 10% of the time in the last 9,000 years. We can therefore conclude that a reduction in the transport of heat to the poles during most of the 20th century is responsible for the planet conserving more energy and warming up, contributing greatly to global warming. And as Sherlock Holmes would say, the IPCC has made a capital mistake by establishing a consensus theory without properly examining all the evidence. All this and much more is explained in my latest book, Solving the Climate Puzzle. I want to thank three other scientists for reading my book before its publication and providing positive feedback. They are William Happer, Professor Emeritus of Physics at Princeton University, who also wrote the foreword to the book, Judith Curry, Professor Emerita of Atmospheric Physics at Georgia Institute of Technology, and Willie Soon, Research Scientist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. I also want to thank Andy May, a writer I have collaborated with on many climate science web articles over the years. The book has been written at several reading levels and divided into a large number of short chapters to make it more accessible to a general audience, despite the inherent complexity of the subject. It has been translated into five languages, of which two have been published and three are in the process of being published. There are plans to publish it in three more languages, including Greta Thunberg's. My main interest for the past nine years has been to find out why and how the climate changes on our planet. It is clear from the evidence that we are missing some essential processes. 
because we don't understand the majority of past climate changes. There are more scientists who agree on this than is usually acknowledged. Several new theories have been developed, including mine, and they should be seriously considered by the IPCC because the CO2 theory lacks sufficient evidence. I defend my theory as having more support from evidence than the consensus one. But what is important to everybody is that on top of the IPCC's capital mistake of reaching a premature consensus, we don't make the capital mistake of embarking the global economy on a planned experiment of unforeseeable consequences. Thank you for watching. You argue that climate change is largely due to natural causes, and in particular, you attribute a key role to high solar activity in the 20th century. How does your theory differ from others who also argue for such a role? Well, the mechanism is different. Uh, there is a lot of debate um, about the role of the sun in climate. And over the last 30 years, there has been a lot of advances in understanding how solar variability affects the stratosphere and how this effect is um, transmitted to the surface. What I add is um, how these uh, effects um, change the energy content of the climate system and thus um, produce um, climate change. Uh, in my book, I uh, present evidence that climate is changing due to changes in uh, the amount of heat that is being transported to the poles. And the amount of uh, solar energy that changes is not uh, that important. So in essence, I refute the IPCC's arguments that uh, dismiss a solar effect on climate based on its uh, small changes in, in energy and in um, the trends in solar activity not being the same as temperature trends. Okay, so how does your work fit with other theories, like there's the role of geothermal heat by Vittorito and Camus, and the role of cosmic rays by Sensmark and Shaviv? It is good that uh, there are all these theories, because in science, uh, we should always um, discuss um, several explanations, because the important point is that um, the climate is always changing. And it is a process that is very complex. So there is not a single cause for, for climate change. So many of these processes may be contributing to climate change, including the, the increase in CO2. And what is important is to determine which ones are the most important in determining climate change. So uh, what uh, we should do is uh, continue researching and, and, and debating these, these processes. It, it is not uh, for me to say, um, to analyze or weigh the evidence supporting uh, these theories or, or others, but uh, any viable theory should um, provide a mechanism for changing the energy balance at the top of the atmosphere, uh, because this is what changes the energy content of the climate system. And it should be supported by the more evidence, the better. And the theory that I propose meets both requirements, while the theory that uh, it is all due to CO2 lacks evidence. What do you think of Joe Bastardi's views about the importance of water vapor in the climate? I think it is fundamental because water vapor is the main greenhouse gas. And what really defines um, the Earth is that it is a planet that has a lot of water in its three states. And I believe that the role of water is uh, to provide stability to the climate system through its thermal iner inertia. This is uh, what explains that for the last 540 million years, when everything has happened, the temperature of the planet has remained compatible with life. So I think none of the IPCC's predictions is going to come true because I think the role of the water is misunderstood and it doesn't behave the way it is expected to behave. I don't think water increases climate change. I think it actually decreases it. 
What do you think about the eruption of the Hunga Tonga uh, volcano in 2022? Is that a major reason for the recent temperature spike? I think it is very likely. Uh, the volcanic eruption of 2022 was very unusual in that it was underwater. So it placed 146,000 tons of water vapor into the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is very dry. So in a single day, the water vapor in the stratosphere increased by 10%. And the greenhouse effect is very sensitive to changes in the stratosphere because it is a lot less opaque to infrared radiation than the troposphere. So the expected effect from this change, as was published in January in Natural Climate Change, is a substantial increase in the warming rate. So, and this is what has been observed. So it, the fact that uh, the onset of this warming has such a delay is normal for volcanic eruptions. For example, the eruption of the Mount Tambora in 1815, in April of 1815, um, produced the year without a summer more than a year later in 1816. So if this explanation is correct, what we should expect is, is over the next months, the warming rate should decrease substantially, and um, this increased warming should disappear over the course of four or five years as the extra water vapor leaves the stratosphere. What other factors influence climate? The climate uh, changes due to um, energy transport and conservation. Uh, the sun's energy is 99.9% .9 constant, and the planet warms up by conserving, en conserving energy better and cools down by losing energy more easily. So this is a, a very complicated process that involves the atmospheric circulation and oceanic currents that I explain in, in my book in an accessible way. And the entire planet responds to it from uh, the speed of rotation to the changes in clouds. Therefore, um, what uh, we should expect from this is that uh, the climate change is the result of changes in, in energy transport. And on, on, on a scale of a few decades, what we observe is that there are oscillations in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, while on the longer term, the main actor is the sun. And in an even longer term, uh, we have the changes to the Earth's orbit uh, that determine how the planet conserves its energy. So answering your question, basically it all responds to the same principle. Okay, so if your theory is correct, what are the economic implications? Well, if humans are, are not uh, primarily responsible for climate change, th this will have a huge uh, implications for the global economy. Um, we should question uh, the energy transition uh, in the form and urgency that is being made because it is not um, exempt of risk. So even um, if um, the theory is correct, um, we, we should be aware that a lot of people will not be willing to accept it regardless of the evidence. So other than the economic implications, if your theory is right, what are the other consequences? Well, I think people should be very calm. Uh, we are very lucky that uh, we are living through a warming period because cooling periods are much worse, are um, usually accompanied by uh, famine and epidemics. And um, being in a warming period is a lot better. So um, we, we should uh, not uh, fear um, climate and only um, when the warming period turns into a cooling period, which will eventually happen, but uh, we don't expect it to happen during the 21st century. So essentially, I think we are uh, very lucky uh, with respect to climate and as long as the cooling period doesn't doesn't uh, start, uh, I think the climate is our ally, not our enemy.
Did you have yes. help uh, from other uh, other climate scientists as you uh, went through this process? Um, no, I really just uh, wrote the 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 book um, on my own. But um, um, I've been very lucky that um, it has the support of such important scientists. And I I should have to say that uh, in its French version, a very prominent uh, French scientist, François Gervais, um, is writing the the and the forward. I would like to thank your audience for uh, their time and interest. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic book, and uh, you do wonderful work. Talk to you next time. Have a good Goodbye.